I'm joined now by Cy Young winner, two-time World Series champ, Barry Zito, the author of Curveball, How I Discovered True Fulfillment After Chasing Fame and Fortune, a memoir which is out now. And Barry, in this book, you talk a lot about your search for, for happiness, for fulfillment, for truth. What fueled that for you? You know, for me, it was growing up like most kids where you have a dream, you want to achieve it. And I think a lot of us can buy into the lie that, you know, if, if, when, if I get this, you know, or if then, if I get this, then I'm going to feel this, feel happy, feel satisfied, feel fulfilled. And I got a lot of things that I dreamed of money and a little bit of fame and baseball success, but there was still a big hole in my heart and it just didn't add up for me. And you continue to try to fill it with different things. This, your, this book is so vulnerable. I think that's one of the things that really stands out. Is you go to a lot um, of dark places and really share your soul with people. What was the scariest thing for you to put in here? The scariest thing? Um, you know, probably my rampant drug use as a 14 and 15-year-old kid. Actually, when I was a kid, you know, I had a father that was always... He was kind of mastering the art of appearance, so he always wanted me to appear as if everything was fine. Uh, so we actually had my record sealed when I was 18, so no one would ever access kind of what happened with the law and things like that. And it felt so good just to tell the truth and be like, I was running from, you know, the baseball crazy schedule and needed something that was my own as a kid, and so I kind of got into all these things. How did that make you feel as a kid that your dad was having your record sealed? Were you relieved or were you like, this isn't real? My father was a great jazz musician uh, with Nat King Cole and had a great career, but he went into talent management. And so when I came along, I, he, he was 50 when I was born, he kind of was managing me as a kid. Uh, but it got a little intense to the point where he would tell my sisters and mom, you know, don't talk to Barry, he's starting today at 12 years old. <laughs> and so wow. you can see how I started, you know, gripping baseball for dear life. And as an adult, that got very bad. Wow, that's a lot for a, for a kid to handle. Another story that was really interesting in here is you talk about how in, in, two, in 2010 you were rooting against the Giants in the World Series after you weren't going to be a part of that um, yeah. postseason. What was going through your mind at the time? What kind of place were you in that you were rooting against your team? Yeah, that was probably the second hardest thing to admit yeah. in the book. Um, I signed a huge contract with the Giants 2007. Just all this money, I didn't know what to make of it. And I underperformed for four years straight, and it all came to a head uh, that year. That fourth year in the postseason, I wasn't allowed to pitch. And I sat in the dugout and watched my team win the World Series, which was so crazy for me. When I had gotten paid the most money to come do that with the team and lead them. So after that, my head kind of split open, and I was like, wow, I... I can't, I can't do this alone anymore. I don't know how to do it. My own strength ran out. Mm. What kind of thoughts do you have in that moment? You're sitting in the dugout. What's going through your head? Are you feeling conflicted about cheering against them? I was just so miserable. My ego was kind of leading my life for many years, um, which went, you know, which was fine when life was going well. Uh, but then my ego was having me just say, you know, if the Giants can lose, I can get out of here, and it will prove that they can't do it without me. I mean, that's how twisted our ego can make us. Mm. It's just bizarre. Let's talk about uh, your relationship with San Francisco now, with the fans. Um, what is that like now for you? I'm grateful that I got to help win the 2012 World Series so I can, I made a joke, but like, I love the restaurants in San Fran. Glad I can show my face there again, get some food, bring my wife. Um, I honestly thought I'd never be able to show up there again, but uh, San Francisco is a magical place, and I always get the warm and fuzzies. Thank God, I'm, you know, I get those now when I go back because I have great memories of the city and, uh, and Oakland, too. And the low point, what was when you're saying, I thought I would never be able to go back there, what kind of stuff were you experiencing when it was the, the low points uh, you know, between I would, the fans? Yeah, I mean, at the ballparks, one thing when you get worn out, but I would go to public places, you know, restaurants, bars, and people would be screaming my name, you know, expletive Zito or get out of here from like across the room. It was kind of surreal. That had to be awful. It was, yeah. I mean, that's why I just enveloped myself in shame and wouldn't leave the house and, you know, a lot of stuff I write about in the book. I mean, I just, it, <laughs> my world was crumbling. Something had to change. And so 2012 was very different for you. What was the biggest difference between that? Besides playing, emotionally, what was the biggest difference between that World Series? Yeah, emotionally, I mean, my approach in 2012 was so much different than in 2010. I think I was, you know, just begging for dear life that I could validate the contract, get people to love me, get people to approve of me, and say I was worth the money. And, you know, after that 2010 experience, I just stopped living for myself, 
you know, found this great connection with something on high. It was incredible and started to live for that mm -hmm. and to glorify, you know, God instead of my own ego. Mm -hmm. And so it was wonderful. In 2012, I had no fear of losing or being, you know, scorned from the city. Wow. And everything just kind of fell into place. And we won the World Series that year, too. Uh, one of the pitchers you out dueled in that series, Justin Verlander, he's been very outspoken lately about the balls being juiced. <laughs> yeah. What are your thoughts on that? You know, people don't really know, but this is the first year that the Major League ball has been used in AAA. And if you look at the home run numbers in AAA compared to the ball they used to use, you make the judgment for yourself. I'm not saying anything, but it's, it's pretty uh, substantial. The other big story in the baseball season this year is the home run record that's been shattered. What do you make of this spike in home runs? You know, there's two schools of thought on baseball, right? One is the home runs are so exciting. We want to see those guys running around the bases and the fireworks. And then the other one is we want to see the one nothing pitcher's duel, you know, like Sandy Koufax back in the day, you know, pitching against Juan Marichal. Um, I like that school of thought personally. Uh, I think defense is the art and pitching, but you know, I think uh, home runs put butts in seats, and there's something to be said for that. This, but you know, attendance is down. Attendance is down across so the league, even though we're seeing these crazy high scores. Something we talk about on our show all the time. Um, what do you make about the the last couple of free uh, off seasons in free agency have been very quiet. You're seeing a lot of younger players taking these big extensions now. What do you make of this trend that we're seeing when it comes to the free agency and the contracts? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I signed a seven-year deal, and I think now the seven-year deals, I mean, especially for pitchers and all these Tommy Johns, I mean, you're not going to see that too often. Uh, you know, the game is changing. I think owners and Major League Baseball are morphing with the times, and, you know, you get a young talent that's getting paid, you know, minimum or close to it, you save a lot of money re-upping that guy so long as he stays healthy. Do you think that we are trending towards a work stoppage? It's something that a lot of people have been kind of predicting with the way that the contracts have been going. It's an interesting uh, question. I was actually the union rep for many years when I played, and so I would go to the union meetings and hear the inside. And, you know, at the end of the day, here's the question, and this might be controversial, but as fans, would you rather have the money go in the pockets of the owners or of the players? Because I promise it's going somewhere. Mm -hmm. And my thought always was, why not give it to the guys on the field? Yeah. Well, do you think that, that we're going to have a work stoppage? I think the baseball union is the strongest in this country for a reason cool. and that and that they got to stick together because like I said the money is coming in. Um, let's talk about your friendship with Barry Bonds. Uh, you guys have the the Barry shirts um, and uh, you know obviously he's a, a controversial figure in the sport as well. What is the biggest misconception that people have about him? Oh you know I think a lot of people in the public eye get pigeonholed. Barry's Misconception number one, I think that he's some monster that's like trying to, you know, pull it over the world's eyes because he's got all these things. I, you know, I don't really know that world. I know that Barry's one of the sweetest guys I've ever met. He's just got this infectious smile and this, this heart. Uh, and I was lucky enough to, to see that. He let me into his world and he's just really a wonderful guy. Is, uh, um, is that rare for him to let people in in that way? I think so. You know, Barry had a lot of people after him basically his whole career, so I can understand how he had his guard up and was treading lightly around people. But, you know, for whatever reason, I got to get the, the real smile, and it was great. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, do you think he should be uh, in Cooperstown? You know, it's an interesting question, and I'll say that a lot of these guys are setting a precedent, right? And they, they look at this era, and there's all these guys that should be in the hall, and they're not getting in. And... I just feel like whatever happens, you can't let one in and not let the others in. Mm. You know, you either keep all of them out or you let them all in because that middle ground is going to get tough. You also mentioned your time in Oakland. Of course, you were a, a part of the famous Moneyball Oakland A's. And um, there are a lot of critics that say that the success really stemmed from you, from Tip Hudson, from Mark Mulder, rather than the analytics. <laughs> yeah. What do you think it was? Um, no, you know, that's a hot topic. Yeah. And I would say that, look, we all know that a baseball team is not going to win without a great pitching staff. That's just baseball. Um, it was interesting that they didn't mention that we had the MVP and the Cy Young winner that year uh, or that we had this incredible pitching staff. Right. But, you know, Hollywood's Hollywood and they got to sell movies and they ended up telling the story really well, I thought. Did you have any idea of how prevalent analytics would be in the sport today? I mean, that's like that was like the first of its kind, but it's I mean, it's in the NBA, it's in the NFL now. 
it's yeah i think there's not a lot of room left to interpretation or you know that gut sense of i think this guy's going to be great i don't know what it is he's got that x factor now they go i think this guy's going to be great look and if he isn't then i you can't get mad at me because look i just followed the analytics and I, you know people got to take bigger risks i think curveball how i discovered true fulfillment after chasing fame and fortune out now barry zito thank you so much for stopping by and for sharing more of your life and your story with us. Absolutely, thanks so much.